Oops, later. Um, as we jump in, we're in this series called Ezekiel, and, and this is if, if this is your first Sunday with us, I have to just, uh, in general, just say this isn't always like this, okay? Um, it, this is a weird Sunday. The last few Sundays have been weird weeks, and it's been funny because I've seen a lot of new faces, and I've had to sort of make the same apology. of this. I promise we don't always talk about stuff like this. Um, but this is where we're at in the scriptures, okay? So this is my little preamble, and we are in a section that contains some graphic language that may be offensive to some hearers, okay? Um, and especially those with younger children. So uh, this may lead to some interesting conversations with some people in your household if they're here in the service, and that's we leave that up to you as parents for wisdom. Uh, but this is where we stand, and we're in this section in Ezekiel 16. I don't know about you, I grew up in church, okay? And uh, we grew up in, I grew up in a church that had old school pews. And in the old school pews, there was old school hymnals and old school... Uh, uh, him, uh, yeah, pew rack Bibles, right? And I remember many of Sundays or well, Sunday nights or whatever I was there, you know, you would be hanging out and you'd be trying to pay attention, but the pastor was talking for too long like this one does. And, and you just kind of got bored. And it was a day, I know the kids these days struggle to know this, but there was a day before smartphones. So we didn't have, you know, it was, I couldn't even ask for my, you know, kids these days, they like ask for their parents' phone when they get bored. We didn't have any of that. So what did you do? You filled out the greeting card, right? And you, you, you filled it out with a phony name, you know, like Daffy Duck, and you made up an address, and you filled that. And so that would take about five minutes, and you'd have a good laugh. And then, and then you'd get the hymnal out, and you'd like flip through the hymnal. That thing's kind of boring. And so then you'd pick up the Bible, you know, and you'd be flipping through the Bible. And I remember on a couple occasions, you know, opening to the middle of my Bible or the Bible in the pew, like the one uh, into a section like what we have this morning. And just kind of thinking to myself as I'm reading, I, I didn't know we were allowed to say these words in church. Like if I said the words that are on this page, I would get grounded for a week. And, and, and so there's some content in the middle of the Bible that is shocking to us. It's a little surprising, and it's sections that we don't talk about a lot. Uh, but we're going there this, this, uh, this summer to these challenging portions for a purpose. And that's because one of them is that they were uh, really near and dear to the heart of Jesus and to the apostles. See, we, talked, we read this uh, verse last week in my little preamble to this. Um, 2 Timothy 3.16, we're familiar with this. This is actually one that I've done, I, my son and I do at bedtime sometimes. It says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, Paul's writing this to Timothy at a time when the New Testament was still in the process of being written. Right? The Gospels, some of them were not even written yet. Paul himself was in the process of writing a letter that will become Scripture and become a part of the New Testament. But when he uses that word Scripture, Paul is probably in his mind primarily thinking about what we call the Old Testament, which was to them just the Bible, right? It was, it was the Scriptures. And he says, all Scripture. Now, Paul is a, is a Jewish scholar, right, before he comes to Christ. He, he knew all the things that were in there. When he said all Scripture, he meant all, every verse, so, so we, we hold dear one of, one of the values that we put up in the hallway, right, is the first one is that we trust Jesus, or, or sorry, we put Jesus first, and then the second one is we trust the, the Bible, right? So when the Bible says the Bible's important, we pay attention. Even the stuff that we struggle to understand or we read and get, we blush a little bit to see what's in there. Um, so, uh, Luke 24, this is another passage that's uh, sort of along the same lines. That I'll give you the brief rundown. So Jesus just rose from the dead, right? And he uh, appears to these men who are on a journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And during this se sequence of events, he, uh, he, he comes and he walks with them, but he hides his identity from them. So he, they don't know he's talk they're talking to the risen Jesus. Like, what a day, Right? And so they're, they're talking, and they're talking about how Jesus uh, lived and how Jesus died, and that's all they know of the story so far, 
right? That Jesus lived and that Jesus died. They don't know that Jesus rose. And so in verse 25, after listening to them talk about how sad they are that he's dead, which is just kind of funny to think about, right? I mean, he's standing right there, and they're talking about how sad they are that he's dead. Um, he says, he says, he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that, what's it say? The prophets have spoken. We're talking about the prophets this morning. He says Ezekiel had something to say about this. Isaiah had something to say about this. And he said, you guys are slow of heart to understand what they had to say. He says, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets. So, that, so he's saying the Old Testament from the beginning, from Genesis all the way to Malachi. From Moses all to all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. You see that word all again, just like in 2 Timothy. And Jesus, it's a, it must have been a long walk if he had time to explain the whole Old Testament. But I think a little hyperbole is being used here, but we get the point, right? He says, you guys, you guys have been reading this the whole time, but you haven't been understanding the point of it. I'm here to tell you, Jesus says, the point was me. The point was my, that, that I had to suffer, that I had to die as the Christ so that I could be raised to glory. And what he says is it's actually, if you read it with the Holy Spirit, and if you read it with New Testament eyes, the Old Testament is preaching the gospel to us around every corner. And that's what we're going to see this morning, how even in a section that would, uh, we, many of us would look at and say, I don't know what to do with this. This seems like it's not safe for work. This seems like something that I would not, uh, I, this is not the kind of content I would choose to consume on a regular basis. Yet it is a text, in my opinion, that boldly proclaims the gospel of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's what we're going to do this morning. Last week, we talked about how um, God doesn't just see what's going on in our heart, but he wants to restore it. And this week, we're going to talk about how God wants us to see our sin from his perspective. He wants us to understand how we have betrayed him so that we can truly understand his love. But he has to take us on a journey I'll be honest, a really heavy and dark journey to get us there. So let's look at this chapter. It begins in verse 1. In Ezekiel 16, chapter, uh, verse 1, it says, Again, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abominations. What a start, Right? And this is, so this is where I get, if you want to know, Pastor Ben, where do you get your key principle, your main idea? Right there. God wants to let his people know about their sin. He wants to convict them of their sin. He wants to show them how it feels to be betrayed the way he has been betrayed by them. And, and, and so he's doing that for a purpose, and, and the end purpose is so that we and all believers for all time could understand just how much he loves us. Because in spite of the betrayal, in spite of the sin that we have all committed, he still chose to suffer on the cross for us. He still chose to go to the cross, to be buried in a tomb, and raised again so that we could be raised to life with him, in spite of all the things that we've done. If that's not the gospel, I don't know what is right? And so, but we first have to go on this journey to discover what is sin? What are, in, in, the, in their Old Testament language, what are the abominations? Verse 3, um, we'll continue our reading. He says, and say, thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, your origin and your birth are of the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. And as for your birth, on the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to cleanse you, nor rubbed with salt, nor wrapped with swaddling cloths. No eye pitied you to do any of these things to you out of compassion for you, but you were cast out on the open field, for you were abhorred on the day you were born. And I passed by you, and saw you wallowing in your blood. I said to you in your blood, live. I said to you in your blood, live. 
I made you flourish like a plant of the field, and you grew up and became tall and arrived at full adornment. Your breasts were formed and your hair was, had grown, yet you were naked and bare. So the first seven verses in, in my outline is how God rescues his people. And he tells the story, um, you know, m- many of us, uh, he tells this story in, in a sort of parable. How many of us are familiar with parables, right? If I say that word, we know what we're talking about. It's a story, uh, an illustrative story with a purpose. And it never calls it a parable, but it helps us a little bit to, to throw that title on what's happening here. Because there's going to be some things said that, are gonna, that, are, that don't make 100% sense. But if we just go with it, right? that this is an artistic rendering, so to speak, that this is a, an illustration, not necessarily a description of reality as it was happening, then it helps us to make sense of what God is saying. Because he, he knows, Jesus knew, that we connect with stories really well, right? Like as a culture, we have a, we have a, a love for stories. Every culture has had a love for stories. For us, it's like movies and television. For ancient people, it was, it was oral storytelling. But we have a connection with stories. And so he's going to tell a story. And the first part of the story is how this, how this character, this, it's sort of like an anthropo, what is that right? The anthropomorphized, right? When, when something takes human form that isn't actually human, uh, it's that idea of like Jerusalem becomes, for the sake of this illustration, for the sake of the parable, this woman. And at first, actually, a baby girl that is born and that is basically, not basically, it very graphically, right, just described how this baby was abandoned and left for dead. Um, it, it sort of like reminds me of like the story of the Good Samaritan, except for it's like way more extreme, Right? Because this isn't like a grown man that was beaten, left bloodied in the field. This is a, this is a baby, right? Um, and I think that the main point of this, this initial paragraph, is to say this, that Jerusalem, who here represents God's people, would never have survived the early moments of its life without God's intervention, that's, that's to me, if you boil it all down and you get past the blood and the gore and sort of the shock of the image of an abandoned baby in a field, that's what he's saying. Because it's kind of interesting, think about it, like think about the rest of the animals, the creatures that God created, right? I, I grew up on a dairy, far, a dairy farming community around dairy cows. Like calves can stand within like five, ten minutes of being born, Right? If you've ever been around critters, like, there's a lot of animals that are born and are relatively, de- like, independent within a pretty short period of time. Like, can at least find food and stand and walk around. Human babies, on the other hand, take a solid year and a half to be able to do much of anything. And if some of your parents, you've learned this. Like, this thing is pretty useless if I wasn't here. And, like, this is true, right? We're... De- but it's an image, right? And so infancy, human infancy, is this image of dependency. And I think God, God made us this way on purpose. When he, so when he calls us sons and daughters, that like I always thought about like grown kids. And I, when, I, when I got a kid, I'm like, oh, now I understand. I'm totally dependent, right, on my heavenly Father to care for me. And so this is the thing he's pointing out. He's, say, he's saying, like, there was nobody else who cared for you. There was nobody else who's even that says that your eye pitied them. Like they, they, they threw you out in the street and left you for dead. But I saw you and I said, I have a plan. And, and so just at this, this first truth might seem so basic, but I think it's actually the core to understanding this whole story. Because when we forget where we came from, when we forget that our dependence on when we forget our dependence on God, right? If we, if we today were to start forgetting that, then tomorrow we start down a path that can lead down to some very dark things because we forget where we came from. Psalm 139, uh, 139.3 says it this way, 
uh, this is referring to God, a, a prayer to God. It says, you formed me in my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw the un, my unformed substance in your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. God shows up in the life of Jerusalem. God shows up in our lives this morning and reminds us, I rescued you. I, I made you. I have a plan for you. And one of the most despicable lies that is out there in our culture today is that people are accidents, right? Right? That there's, there's no ultimate purpose behind who we are. And the Bible comes into that world and says that's false. And that's actually the start of our walk towards darkness as a culture, right? As a people. Because we don't believe that every life is value. That we don't believe that we have value because God says we have value. And so God starts this story by reminding um, Jerusalem, this representative of God's whole people, to say, hey, I, I not only made you, but in this, in this version of the story, right, I rescued you from, from what would have been sheer, sheer death. Like, there's no way you could have survived without my grace, without my provision, God had a desire and had a plan for Jerusalem, and so he intricately involved himself in its founding, and he's done the same for us. He's intricately involved himself in the story, in your backstory. And some of us, we haven't even begun to like do business with that because we're convinced that our backstory is all bad. And it's true, there, there could be some incredible pain, some incredible darkness in our history and in our past, but God says, but I was still there. I was still there working, bringing you even to this moment, right? Before we could ever respond, before we could even remember, right? This kid, uh, this little baby girl has no memory of that, those early moments. We don't have any memory of our early moments and who took care of us and who changed our diapers and who fed us, right? We find out later it was mom or whoever it was, right? But but here, but but th- that all happened apart from us. We didn't choose it, and God's and it's a beautiful illustration of God's love for us, right? Before we even know what's happening, God comes in and rescues us, and He saves us, and He and He provides for us. He's working His power to miraculously bring about His plan in us. The next section talks about how God blesses His people, so He rescues His people, and then He blesses. His people, his people being represented by this character, this woman. It says, When I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you were at the age for love, and I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord God, and you became mine. Then I bathed you with water and washed off your blood from you and anointed you with oil, and I clothed you also with embroidered cloth and shod you with fine leather. I wrapped you in, a fi- in fine linen and covered, covered you with silk. I adorned you with ornaments and put bracelets on your wrists and, on your cha- and a chain on your neck. And I put a ring in your, on your nose and earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver, and your clothing was of fine linen and silk and embroidered cloth. You ate fine flour and honey and oil. You grew exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty, and your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through the splendor that I had bestowed on you, declares the Lord. Okay, so uh, this text comes under a lot of scrutiny because there's mixed metaphors going on here, right? And the first metaphor is of this child rescue moment, and then the second metaphor is of this marriage moment. And so people get weirded out by that, and it's understandable. But uh, the point is that there's two metaphors being blended, and these are scriptural metaphors we see all the time, right? We refer to God as a father, and we also know that we as the church are the bride of Christ. 
and these are metaphors. It's like, it's help, these are all tools to help us understand this relationship with God. And so that's all that's happening here, okay? And so within that metaphor, the city of Jerusalem um, was a special part of God's plan and covenant with Israel. Um, it emerged as the city of David after the conquest of King David that were led in the region. Um, if you've read the story, we know that like God gave uh, the Israelites this whole land and says, "I want you to con- like I'm gonna I'm gonna kick the people out of the land if you're only obedient." And they weren't obedient, right? They were like half obedient, and so only half of the land becomes theirs. And so the, throughout the story, the borders of Israel sort of ebb and flow, but it's during King David's reign that Jerusalem becomes property of the, of the Jews, of God's chosen people, and it becomes his, his city. It's called the city of David, and it's where he sort of establishes the national capital. And, um, and so it's there that God gives this sort of expansion of the covenant with God's people to David, and it's called the Davidic Covenant. We'll look at it really quickly here. Basically, God shows up and says, I took you from the pasture, talking to David, from following the sheep, and that you should be prince over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make of you a great name like the name of the great ones of the earth, and I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. He says, And violent men shall afflict them no more, as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares that you uh, declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Okay, so, um, oh, it's not done yet. It says, uh, yeah, so when the days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Who's he talking about, if we're still paying attention? He's talking about a couple different people. The most direct and obvious thing in the story is Solomon, but ultimately we know he's also talking about Jesus, right? And it says, I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son. And when he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And you and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever, because before me your throne shall be established. What's that word? Forever. That word forever is a big deal in the covenants, right? Because it means forever. Forever means it doesn't end. It's a perpetual contract and agreement and covenant. And so God gives this covenant to David, and he says, this throne that you've established in Jerusalem, I'm going to, I'm going to keep it. I'm going to secure it. It's going to be a forever kingdom. The problem for Ezekiel in his day is what? God's people are in the process of being taken into captivity, and that doesn't sound like a forever throne, does it? It sounds like a temporary throne. And so Ezekiel, one of the big purposes of Ezekiel is for God to say, hey, when I said forever, I didn't mean that like kind of, sort of. Like I meant forever. And so I'm here to tell you, though it looks like it's all over for y'all, it's not. There's, there's going to come a day when you're going to come back and you're going to be back in the land and I'm going to establish a forever throne. I'm not done doing what I promised to David. And all of that happens in the context of this place, Jerusalem, right? In the years that followed this promise that we just read, um, the city grew to prominence, not just for Israel, but for the whole world. Some of you remember from Sunday school, the story of the Queen of Sheba right? Who I have, the, I have that story on the screen, but we're not going to read it for time. But the point of the story is this, the, the city becomes so rich, becomes so opulent, becomes such a marvel of the world that uh, uh, this foreign queen comes all the way bringing gifts to Solomon, right? And, and what she says, the summary of what she says is basically, I heard that this was a cool, 
cool place that God had blessed it, but the half of it wasn't told me, she says. So this is the point of all this, what feels like rambling, right? Is that God took this, this infant baby version of Jerusalem and he rescued it. But then later it says that the, he, he finds, he comes back and marries this woman and doesn't just rescue, but blesses. Right, so with the marriage comes all of these things, and it's like a it's like a target list from like the ancient world of all the stuff, right? That that he bought. It's like he buys his wedding presents, and there's all of this jewelry and all of this clothing, and he and he's pointing out all of these things. And what he's saying to the ancient Israelites is. You guys, uh, remember how good it was under King David and under King Saul? That was because of the covenant that I made. That's because of my promise to you. And what he says to us who sit and are the recipients of God's promise and and the recipients of of, uh, of the followers of Jesus, right, who have not just been rescued from our sin but brought to new life and then given all the blessings that we have, right, to steward, he says, I'm the one who is the source for everything that you have. Without me, you'd be, uh, it says that she was naked and bare right? That, that gets us all weirded out because that sounds like really like racy. That's not the point at all. What he's saying is, you didn't have anything, and then I gave you everything that you have. And at this point, like, it should just be like a party, right? Because here, here is the story of, of how I, God saved, not just saved my life, but then gave me all of these blessings and has just bountifully showed his love to me out of his compassion, and But this is where God and his people are divided. Because they believed, as we humans often do, that their success was because of them. That their stuff came from all of their hard work. That they were a self-made city. Look at, look at us, proud of everything we've done. And rather than praising God, praising God, right, they became patriotic. And rather than than confessing uh, and saying, he's the one that's our source, they started looking in the mirror, saying, I look pretty good. This life I've got is pretty good. There must be something special about me. They attributed their military success, their economic flourishing, the peace, and the culture that they had built to themselves, and they forgot that it was God, right, who brought them into the land, who brought them out of slavery in Egypt, who gave them victory over their enemies, who put breath in their lungs, that gave them the laws that made it peaceful to live there, that provided everything that they had, and then grew it to abundance. They forgot that. And it's about to get real ugly, right? Because in verse 15, it says, but you trusted in your beauty, and played the whore because of your renown, and ravished your whorings on every passerby, your beauty became his. And so what we're about to read, is I'm going to warn you, a really long section that's got some language in it that's not safe for work and for, like, you know, typical church stuff. But what is being described here is how God's people were deceived by sin's senseless evil. Verse 16, we'll pick up. He says, You took some of your garments and made for yourselves colorful shrines on which them, and on them you played the whore. The like has never been, nor will ever be. You also took your beautiful jewels of my gold and my silver, which I have given you, and made for yourself images of men, and with them played the whore. And you took your embroidered garments to cover them and set my oil and my incense before them. Also my bread that I gave you, I fed you with fine flour and oil and honey. You set before them for a pleasing aroma. And it was, declares the Lord God. And you took your sons and your daughters whom you had born to me. And these you sacrificed to them to be devoured. 
were your whoring so small a matter so that you slaughtered the children, my children, and delivered them up as an offering by fire to them? And in all your abominations and your whorings, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare, wallowing in your blood. And after all your wickedness, woe, woe to you, declares the Lord God. You built yourself a a vaulted chamber and made yourself a lofty place in every square. At the head of every street, you built your lofty place and and made your beauty an abomination, offering yourself to any passerby and multiplying your whoring. You also played the whore with the Egyptians, your lustful neighbors, who multiplied your whoring to provoke me to anger. Behold, there I stretched out my hand against you and diminished your allotted portion and delivered you to the greed of your enemies and daughters of the Philistines who were ashamed of your lewd behavior. You played the whore also with the Assyrians because you were not satisfied. Yes, you played the whore with them, and still you were not satisfied. You multiplied your whorings also with the trading land of Chaldea, and even with this you were not satisfied. How sick is your heart? declares the Lord God. Because you did all these things, the deeds of a brazen prostitute, building your vaulted chamber at the head of every street and making your lofty place in every square, yet you were not like a prostitute because you scorned payment. Adulterous wife, you who receive strangers instead of her husband. Men give gifts to all prostitutes, but when you give your gifts to all your lovers, bribing them to come to you from every side with your whorings. So you were different from other women in your whorings. No one solicited you to play the whore. And you, were in, in, or, and you gave payment while no payment was given to you. Therefore, you were different. So uh, there are a few sections of Scripture as uncomfortable to read as that. Um, and there's a good reason for it. Fourteen times the Hebrew word zaznuth is translated by the ESV into the word whore. And so other, other translations use words like harlot, like prostitute, and the specific word that is being used here is only found in the book of Ezekiel. So there's very, we don't very, know very little about like the nature of the word other than like what it obviously means, right? And so the ESV translated it the way that they did in order to emphasize the shock of the story, because remember where we were at in this sort of character arc. The, this, this, this version, this illustration of God's people in the form of this woman goes from this little baby who's saved to this wife who is blessed and given all of these adornments and is basically goes from like would have been abandoned and never survived like the early moments of her life to being a queen. I mean, that's what he, he says, you were, you were raised to royalty. And so it's, it is a non, I look at it as like a non sequitur of a story. It's a story that makes no sense whatsoever that somebody would be in that position and would give that all up to do what has just been described. Like that makes no sense whatsoever. And I think right there, that right there, is the point of the story. That God wants us to see from his perspective the foolishness and the senselessness and the evil of sin, of choosing to do things our way instead of God's way. The idea of an unfaithful wife or even prostitution is a common metaphor in the prophetic writings, though the way it's used here is pretty unique, right? In his Hosea, God tells the prophet to go and marry an unfaithful wife as an illustration. But again, the progression of this chapter from an abandoned child to basically a queen, then into a life of this like weird prostitution situation is supposed to make us scratch our head. It's supposed to say, this doesn't make any sense. And God says, exactly, exactly. No one in the ancient world would accept the progression as a reasonable series of events. In the Near East, in the time this was written, it's a shame-based culture that was more worried about honor than personal comfort or individualism, right? 
And so for this woman to do what she does, it's, it just makes zero sense. The woman, she goes beyond scorning God as the husband, but systematically, if you notice, right, she systematically uses each of the gifts that were described in the last section, they get mentioned again. But this time, it's how she's misusing them and abusing it for her own gain, for her own pleasure, for her own plan. And so we see these, this pop up in the repeated use of these uh, possessive pronouns. He says, um, he says, you also took your, be- your beautiful jewels of my gold and my silver, which I had given to you and made for yourselves images of men. And this, this sentence in particular should remind us of another Old Testament story, right? Where God's people take uh, bracelets and rings and, and jewels and all kinds of things. And what do they do? They give them to Aaron, and Aaron melts it all down, and he makes a golden calf. What's interesting in the golden calf story is that the gold is actually uh, like one of the keys to understanding the point of that story. Because if you go back into the story of the Exodus, Moses carefully tells us how God had always promised that when they left Egypt, they would leave with, with, with gold and silver and with precious things. That the, and it says on the way out, the Egyptians were like chucking things out the window. Like they were like opening grandma's old jewelry bin and like dumping it out the window at the Israelites as they pass by. And so these former slaves become millionaires on the way out. But within, within a couple of weeks, they cash in everything God gave them to worship the golden calf. Isn't that a, a reflection of the story that we just read? And, and isn't that an illustration of sin in our own hearts? Right? See, because as long as we just see sin as kind of not good stuff God sort of says we shouldn't do, and instead understand it as betrayal, right? As, as like, you know, it's one thing to do something you know is wrong, and it's another way to flaunt it and to do it in a way that you know is going to hurt somebody else. Right? There's a difference between the kid who, like, yeah, it, it's, there's, this is what we do every time that we choose to, to lust, right? It's, it's where we are taking the eyes God gave us to satisfy some craving that we have. It's what we do every time we lie. Because we take the tongue that God gave us and we use it to deceive somebody else who God made in his image and whom he loves. It's what we do when we, when we aren't generous. We refuse to honor God with the things that he gave us. And, and so in this section, right, God is saying, all of these things are things I gave you. And you're not just, you're not just being um, disrespectful. You're, it's, he says you're an adulterous wife. Some of us, have a context for a deep-seated, intimate betrayal like that, right? Others of us don't. But, I, but, but he tells us this story so that we can put ourselves in his shoes, right? And think about the reason I say these things are wrong is because he says they're an abomination, they're, they are taking the thing that I made for my purpose, which is you, right? We are made in his image for his plan, and we serve another God. And for us, it's not usually this a golden calf. And for us, it's usually not melting down jewelry to build a statue, right? But we do it in all kinds of other ways, don't we? Cashing in the things God gave us to serve ourselves. And so, that leads us to verse 35, where God judges that senseless evil of sin. And he says, Therefore, O prostitute, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, because your lust is poured out and your nakedness 
uncovered and your whorings with your lovers and with the abominable idols and because of the blood of your children that I gave to them, that, that, that you gave to them. Therefore, behold, I will gather all your lovers with whom you took pleasure and all you loved and all those you hated, and I will gather them against you from every side and I will uncover your nakedness to them that they may see your nakedness. And I will judge you as women who commit adultery and shed blood are judged and bring upon you the blood of your wrath, the blood of wrath and jealousy and I will give you into their hands and they will throw down your vaulted chamber and break down your lofty places they will strip you of your clothes and take your beautiful jewels and leave you naked and bare they will bring up a crowd against you and shall stone you and cut you to pieces with their swords and they will burn your houses and execute judgments upon you in the sight of many women. I will make you stop playing the whore, and you will give me, and you shall also give payment no more. So I will satisfy my wrath on you, and on my jealousy shall depart from you. I will calm, be calm, and will no longer be angry, because you have not remembered the days of your youth, but have enraged me with all of these things. Therefore, behold, I have returned your deeds upon your head, declares the Lord God. Have you not committed lewdness in addition to all your abominations? So God judges. And in this section, he turns as the righteous judge over the sin of Jerusalem. And he reads off the rap sheet in the first few verses, right? Numerous counts of adultery. Numerous counts of idolatry. Numerous counts of of murder, and if you knew Torah, right, if you knew the Old Testament law, the each one of these carries a single penalty, which was death. There was a zero tolerance policy for any of these three actions, and it says Jerusalem in this story was profoundly guilty of all three. And so the prophet describes as what is left of this personified city, its vaulted chambers and lofty places, its clothes, its jewels are all removed, and it's returned to the same desperate state that it was found, right? Naked and serving a death sentence. Except this time, the only difference is this time she's not a victim of exposure, but a just execution, and descriptions of a woman being stoned and torn limb from limb are hard to read. They leave us with very logical questions, right? Like, if God is good, how is this part of the story? If we hop into this section without the context of the rest of the Bible, especially without meditating on Jesus' own suffering, we could easily walk away confused and frustrated from this chapter. And my hope this morning is that that's not you. First, we have to understand that we are reading the moment where God's warnings expire and justice must be served. For 400 years, God sent warning to his people about this moment, and they didn't listen. And every parent knows, right, that clearly warning a child about consequences is an important part of discipline. Before you bring the rod, before you bring in the discipline, whatever it is, right, whatever your plan is for disciplining your kids, Warning them is a good way of teaching them to make a decision, the right decision, before you have to intervene. But we've all been in a situation where we've been around parents who do a lot of warning and never do any discipline. Kids are smart, and they figure that out pretty quick, and they know there's not any actually any discipline coming. And so for God to be just, for God to be a loving father, he actually has to discipline. And this is the point that's being made in in Exodus 34, when it says, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. This old description, Old Testament description of God's character says God's love requires him to be a man of his word. There must be a payment for sin. It isn't just an Old Testament reality either. The gospel news about Jesus is all based around this idea. 
And in Romans 6, we see it read, talked about this way. It says that the wages of sin is, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. As brutal as it is to read this passage and its gruesome description of a public execution, it's not the only time in the Bible records someone being stripped naked and publicly, gruesomely executed. At the center of human history stands the cross, right? Where God's own Son bore the iniquity of the fathers and, on the ch and of the children. Jesus' own, right? It says that one of the things it says in the Old Testament law is that when you stone them, you shall not pity them. And it seems like such a cruel thing to say, but it's a point forward to Jesus, right? Who wasn't pitied. His own pity, pitiless, painful death is the fulfillment of this passage where God's wrath and his jealousy is satiated and his justice is served. Like it says in Isaiah 53, that he, referring forward to Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his wounds we are healed. And he says, we all, like sheep have gone astray, have turned everyone to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And the cross cannot ring true as good news until we come face to face with the truth of our depravity and the senselessness of our sin. As long as we view our brokenness as something we can manage, as long as our offenses are insignificant, the cross will seem like a cruel display of God's wrath, as it seems for so many, right? How could God kill his own son? That's what people think. When we understand that just like Jerusalem, we have scorned God's love, we see the cross for what it is, his mercy. We know the cross is never the end of the story, though. And so, so also in this Old Testament gospel, there is a resurrection. Look at verses 59. I'm skipping past some verses for the sake of time. They're good stuff. You can go read them later. It's got a lot of stuff about uh, Sodom and Samaria in it. Um, but verse 59 says, For thus says the Lord God, I will deal with you as you have done, you who have despised the oath in breaking the covenant. Yet I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth. And I will establish you for you an everlasting covenant. Then you will remember your ways and be ashamed when you take your sisters, both your elder and your younger, and give them to you as daughters, but not on account of the covenant with you. And he says, I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall know that I am the Lord, that you may remember and be confounded and never open your mouth again because of your shame when I atone for you for all that you have done declares the Lord God. And we see at the end a promise, right, that God's going to bring an atonement for the sin of God's people through Jesus. But not only that, there's this, there is this picture of the resurrection, right? The judgment against Jerusalem was so total that there was no chance for recovery. Stoning like crucifixion was not designed just to kill, but to do so publicly. No one walked away from a crucifixion wondering if there was a chance that the victim might survive. And the New Testament goes out of its way to record Jesus' death as a historical fact. That there were people who witnessed it, that the Romans basically put their stamp of approval on his execution. He was dead. So that nobody could come back later and say, well, maybe he never really died. Maybe his resurrection didn't happen. He said, no, he was dead. And so it is in this story, right, with, with this woman. She's, she is like as dead as dead can get. But then all of a sudden, the end of the chapter, she says, but I still have a plan for you, right? Well, what's the deal with that? Just as, um, just as we, just as Jesus was dead, Ephesians talks about how we were dead. 
right? He says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins in which we once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now work in the sons of disobedience. But then verse 4, he says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So just as clear as Jesus' death was, so clear was his resurrection. It was confirmed by all of these people. It's a fact. And what's being nodded to in the whole, by the Holy Spirit in these final verses of Ezekiel is this idea, right? That though we were dead in our trespasses and sins, we have been made alive just like Jesus was made alive. That he was the firstborn of the resurrection, that we are following after him. And here's the crazy thing, guys. We talk about resurrection, and generally we talk about, you know, one day when I die, I'll, be, I'll, I'll go and be with Jesus, right? Which is true. But Ephesians, Paul, seems to be talking like a resurrection has already happened that we have been raised to new life in Christ. For Jerusalem, this looked like God's continual favor throughout history, right? The city fell again in in AD 70, but it's clear, just go watch the news, right? There's something special about this place. Like God has clearly got a plan for Jerusalem, the physical place. But for those of us in this room, we celebrate this fact, and this is how we close, right? That though we are guilty of the same heinous rebellion against the same blessed God, Jesus' work on the cross has sealed us who confess him is in a new resurrection life. That what was dead, what, what was destroyed, what was lifeless, now has been given new life. And we have a new heart, and we have a new mind, and He is our God, and we are His people. But here's the thing, guys. Until we understand our sin and our past from God's perspective, we'll never be able to understand truly His love for us. Because in spite of all that, in spite of all that description that we read, he still looks at that woman and says, I still choose you. I still have a plan for you. I still want to work in and through you. That's our God.